So when our family lived overseas, I uh, personally was constantly, constantly unsure of myself whenever I was trying to speak in French. Eventually, perhaps because I was so unsure of everything that was coming out of my mouth, I started to second guess everything I was saying, even in English. I'm like, do I even know how to speak in English anymore? And in one instance, at least, this was a really good thing, because apparently I've spent my entire life using the word or the phrase world wind. World wind. Like, how was your weekend? Oh, I don't even know. It was just so busy and so crazy and everything went by so fast. It was like a world wind. <laughs> so, so doubting myself as I, as I heard myself say that, like for the first time in 40 years, I started to think, wait, is that, is that right? Whirlwind? What does that even mean? <laughs> so I asked my wife and she was like, yeah, you always say whirlwind, which doesn't mean anything. What you mean is whirlwind, sort of like a small tornado. Oh, right. <laughs> that makes way more sense. So often when we find ourselves in a new place or a new situation, we gain this forced awareness because we can't rely on our normal to be normal in that place. And it's exhausting and it's difficult and it makes you want to take a nap all the time, but it can be really good because everyone's normal has things about it that are good and healthy and everyone's normal comes with any number of unhealthy things or for me just things that are plain wrong so other people new places new experiences can help provide us with this observational distance that we talked about last week just as a reminder the kings of Israel had been so focused on their own desire for wealth and power that they didn't see all the ways that they were mistreating people and leading the nation toward catastrophe. They were just too close, too invested in their own outcomes to see the bigger picture and to hear what the prophet Jeremiah was trying to point out. So in the end, Jerusalem was destroyed and the Babylonian Empire took the people into captivity. Now, I don't know about you, but as I said last week, I can often be too close and too invested in my own thing to see things from another perspective or to understand something different than my own. So how can we take a step back from our own lives and from what we, we see to listen to one another and to perhaps see a bigger picture that will connect us to God's way of love and justice. The book of Daniel is set in Babylon during the exile and therefore shows us how the Jewish community was trying to work out for themselves what values they wanted to hold on to and what parts of this new culture they could faithfully include in their lives. So something that highlights this is that there's the book of Daniel is actually written in two different languages. The first is written in Aramaic, which is the language of the empire, of the Babylonian empire. And the second is in Hebrew, their own native language. So perhaps this book is uniquely situated to offer us something unique because of its bilingual, bicultural nature. So it might help if we see Daniel not just as our story, but not our story. So both our story and not our story. It's about us and it's about people who are not like us. So Daniel chapter one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declared war on Jerusalem and attacked it. The king was handed over along with some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in the land of Shinar. Okay, so going back to the different languages, the land of Shinar is a reference to the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, where God gives us the gift of different languages which we celebrate and where God condemned the arrogance and injustice of empires, which is a warning. In Babylon, the people will have to discern between what is good, 
what is bad and what is neither good nor bad. So verse 3, the king ordered Ashpenaz, palace chief, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. Among those who were chosen were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The head of the palace staff gave them new names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, the forced changing of names is a common tactic of those who are trying to control and dominate someone else. Consider how African slaves had their names changed to quote-unquote Christian names here in America. In the early 1900s, Jews in the United States started petitioning courts to have their names changed, their last names changed, because it made it harder, their names made it harder, uh, being Jewish made it harder to get jobs or to advance in their jobs, or for their children to be able to get jobs and advance in their jobs. Writer Austin Channing Brown, who is a black woman, tells the story of being so exasperated at seven years old by all of the confusion around her name, Austin, that she demanded that her mom tell her, why did you name me Austin? And her mom said, well, I mean, the name has this beautiful connection to our family, and your father and I love the name, but then she also confessed that we knew that anyone who saw your name before meeting you would assume that you are a white man. One day, she's seven years old, one day you will have to apply for jobs. We just wanted to make sure that you could make it to the interview. All of these examples are about names given or directed by the pressures of the dominant culture not treating minority groups with respect or with equity. All of these are examples of things right here in America. So, if we take a step back from this story that we claim is our own, I, at least personally, might notice that Daniel is very much not my story. This is a story about a small group of Jews forced out of their homes and now living in a culture that is actively trying to make them not Jewish or even passively trying to make them not Jewish. This is not our story if we are Christians in America. We are the majority. Still today, roughly 68% of Americans identify as Christians. In my lifetime, at least, every time a U.S. president was sworn into the most powerful position in the world, they did it putting their hand on a Christian Bible. Meanwhile, Jews in the United States make up 2%. Two. Muslims make up 1%. The Bible is written primarily from the perspective of minority groups suffering under slavery or exile or into the New Testament in occupation. So what happens when the powerful majority read these stories of faith primarily as our own, not aware of the experience of others? Well, ideally, the Bible would help us see those who are often mistreated and treated differently. Ideally, the Bible would create this more equi equitable society, and obviously there are ways where that happens. But what can also happen is you get this insecure majority who experience any other belief or perspective as a threat to themselves. We experience differences as attacks and disagreements as persecution. We, the majority, 
are somehow the victims that need to be protected at all costs. This, then, is justification that we might use to then exclude and mistreat and even legislate against the people who are actually vulnerable minorities. So, for example, the anti-Semitic story that has been told about Jews in America is that they are the ones who are controlling everything behind the scenes, making 2% of our population the threat. And it's the LGBTQ community, another small and mistreated group, who are often villainized as a threat to Christian values or even worse, a threat to children, both equally untrue. The bully sees themselves as the victim, which makes it okay, even good and righteous, to be the bully. We can avoid this confusion by reading the story of Daniel as both our story and not our story. Of course, it is about God's love and compassion for us. But can we see it especially as God's love and compassion for those who are not us? Can we allow the story to unsettle us just enough to question our own normal? Whirlwind? What does that even mean? Babylon? Wait, are there ways that my life, our lives are tangled up in the actions of Babylon and not just in the actions of the heroes of this story? Daniel, in fact, is a great example for us because he is both part of the suffering minority who is captive, taken captive into Babylon, in that now he is a part of the powerful elite. Daniel's people are suffering in exile, but now he's offered royal food and wine from the king's table. So verse 17 tells us that God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. So they learned the language of Babylon and even the myths and stories of Babylonian culture and faith. Not everything other was experienced as a threat to their values or their identity. At the same time, back in verse 8, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food and wine and instead asked if he could have only vegetables and water. Okay. This was, I mean, other than it being just vegetables and water, this was risky because food and wine came as a directive of the king, of the violent king. So why? It's often thought that the food being offered was, did not fit the Jewish dietary guidelines or restrictions, but there are actually no restrictions about drinking wine. And Jews don't have to be vegetarian. So perhaps Daniel and his friends are moved more by an awareness that the rest of their community in exile doesn't have what they have. The people are eating vegetables and drinking water because that is their only option. The people are eating the simple foods because this is not a time of celebration. So the choice isn't a religious demand, you must all behave in this way, but a personal conviction that comes from their awareness of others and their belief in God's way of love and justice. Love and justice. These are the values worth holding on to in this new place. And as we live out our own lives, the question that Daniel offers us is, what are we holding on to? What are the values that we will hold on to in this place, whether it's new or normal? What are the values we'll keep?
Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your love and compassion that covers all of us. Amen.